All right, safe cracker. Safe. <laughs> this is a good one. So I'm in Wandsworth Prison, and this is back in the day when you had like the Nokia thirty two tens. So phones were quite square. Now, prison lingo, if someone says, listen, that's got to go in the safe, that's jargon for it's got to go up your ass because it's the only place that it is safe <laughs> where the screws can't get to it. So this kid comes in, uh, never been to prison before, and he basically says, look, can you get me a phone? And I was like, it's going to cost you about 500 quid, but I'll get you a phone. And he said, all right, not a problem. So I sorted him out this phone, and it was a big Nokia 3210. And he's got the charger. Now, he didn't have the plug, but he had the charger lead. And he um, he comes into the cell, and there's a few of us in there. Now, with me, I can I can say something can keep a straight face, whereas other people around me, are, they're trying their hardest not to piss themselves. And uh, he come in, he said, right, people are telling me this has got to cut my ass." I said, ah. I said, listen, you've got to wrap it in a breakfast pack, which is like clean film. I said, start with a corner, push it in. I said, after a while, it'd just go in. I said, then forget about it. And he's like... I've tried, it won't go in. I said, listen, there's one thing you can do. And my mate is looking at me thinking, what are you going to come out with? Now, for those people that have been to prison, you know you can get roll-ons on the canteen. So I don't know if you've ever seen an imperial leather roll-on. It's like a white block with a big red screwy top on it, probably about so big. And I said to him, look, wrap one of them in clean film, put all of that into your ass, walk around with it for half the day, that way it prepares your ass for what's coming. <laughs> He's left the cell wearing stitches, right? So about half hour later, <laughs> he's done like a John Wayne walk. <laughs> he went, I got it in. Proper proud of himself. <laughs> and we're like, right, leave it in there for after that. He's like, all right, mate. When he was, you could hear him on the toilet trying to get it out. And he got it out and he, he brought the phone back in. You know, I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was an experience for him. <laughs> Summer in a bowl. Summer in a bowl. Um, Jamie will probably shoot me for saying this, but Jamie was the cameraman for the Britain Beyond Bar series. He uh, he was obviously roaming on the wings um, with it, with his partner, and um, they was coming into the cells, and we'd have a laugh. And on this this one day, there was a load of prison hooch that had been brewed up, and uh, Jamie's coming to the door, and he was like, "What are you up to?" And I said, "We've been making fresh orange juice." He was like, how'd you do that? What would you square? I said, yeah, it's just fresh orange juice. I said, you look a bit parched. I said, come in here. I said, come in the cell. So he's come in the cell and he's got all the camera equipment with him and the lead yeah. hanging down. And he said, I said, yeah, I'll try that. And he went, what is it? I said, it's summer in a bowl. I said, yeah, I'll try it. And he went, no, 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 I can't do it. I said, try it, try it, try it, try it, try it. So I put it he took a big gulp of this thing, the face on it. What's that? <laughs> I said, it's prison hooch. And I said, well, you, I thought you were a journalist. You should try these things. <laughs> so you get an inside grasp of what's going on. And um, yeah, that, that was somewhere in a bowl. He's, um, he'll never forget that, Jamie. Um, what's, yeah. your, what's your hooch recipe? Uh, hooch you normally made up. You, we used to use brown bread. So you get brown bread, you squish it into balls, you put it into a jug of boiling water, add a load of sugar and then put it into like a bottle. Um, now, from experience, you have to put a hole in the lid, which a couple of occasions we didn't do. And we've been sitting in the cell and you, you, you know, the big cleaning bottles, like the 10 litres. We've got them on the pipes. We were sitting there playing the PlayStation. I swear to fucking God, it went bang and everything was covered in orange. <sighs> like literally it was all over us because obviously the where it expands with the heat, the pressure needs to get out. But um, yeah, you literally cook it up. You get it's called a kick. We call it a kick. And once you get the kick, you just add more juice to it: orange juice, apple juice. You leave it to ferment, and then you drink it. And it's just like normal alcohol. Yeah, in Arizona, it's the Sonoran Desert, and it's, so the wall of the cell. It's almost fifty degrees outside. Yeah. So they cook it by putting a plastic bag next to the cell wall. Yeah. But you had to burp the bag. Yeah. To get all the day pressure long, out. Otherwise, yeah. the whole bag's gonna yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what other recipes have you got? Prison recipes. Prison red banoffee pie. That's always a good one. How do you make it? Uh, digested biscuits with a lump of butter, and you put it into. You can get like the little plastic containers. You put it in the bottom and press it down with a spoon. Leave it overnight to set, and then you chop up your bananas. Put your bananas on. You can buy tins of condensed milk. So what you do is you put a hole in the top of the tin, put it inside a plastic bag, and then just leave it in the kettle and wedge sank in the kettle so it constantly boils, and that turns into caramel. You put that all over the bananas and then get your Cadbury's dairy milk and melt that over the top of it, and then it sets very, very sickly after a while, but what a treat it is. It's like your favourite? Oh, absolutely in there, absolutely. What other kind of stuff did the prisoners make? 
you add hooch. Um, obviously, the new thing with the vape pens, because you're not allowed to smoke in prisons anymore. So they've had to be creative in the way that they do spice. So you need to burn the spice. So you get like the little cartridges with the flavours in. They will cut one of those in half. So it's got the uh, the burning bit at the bottom, you know, the little spring that heats up. And uh, they'll put the bit of paper on top and then they'll suck it through a pen. Um, what else is there? There's loads of little things. You've got the hooch. Um, obviously lines. If you're um, banged up or there's been a riot or for whatever reason you're banged up, you're stuck in your cell and you need a roll up or you need something, you make a line so you rip loads of sh strips of bed sheet put something kind of heavy on the end and it's like spaghetti junction out the windows it's like swing it to 15 to get it to 12 and it's like that keeps you occupied for a few hours fishing lines yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> same thing with the parcels um parcels will come over and you'd have to throw the line out and hook it and bring it back in um it's funny because in um around about that time i had the uh, the affair with the officer in high point some absolute genius discovered that the bars on the windows if you got a wet towel and you put the wet towel around the windows and then put a, ch a table leg in it and squeeze them, you could bow the bars in. Now, for whatever reason, the bars that were in place wasn't man enough to take it, so they bowed out. So I'm lying in bed one night and I've looked out the window and it was like a black father Christmas. My mate Cliff, he's like this great big black geezer, he's gone running past with a bin line and we went, don't worry, we're sorted. And he's gone back through the window and it went on for about a month. And then they literally shut the whole prison down and they'd done every single window in the jail. But that, that was quite amusing. What about tattooing? Tattoo uh, guns? Yeah, I'm, I see it going on in there. But the, the thing with prisons is... is Back then, hep C was a, a big problem in jails and to use dirty needles and ink, it just, it weren't for me. So I never had anything like that done, but I did see it going on. So you've described a few funny scenarios. What's the funniest thing you ever saw in prison? In prison, the funniest thing? Um, I had a nicking. Uh, I think I'd had about 16, 17 nickings in high down, all for fighting and various other shit. And it got to the point that the governor was on me. She was she was like Miss Trunchbull, I used to call her. And um she was like, I'm gonna get ya. As soon as you fuck up again, I'm gonna get ya and you're getting shipped out. And what happened was we had this um this geezer that was meant to be bringing something in on a visit. And uh for whatever reason he fucked it up. Uh do you remember I said about your A, B, and C wings? They're all caged off at the end and in the middle it's called the center and that's like the safe part for the officers but if you're a cleaner or a trusted prisoner on the wing you're allowed out into these areas now this geezer was on the other side of the bars and i was in the middle and obviously he's come down there's a few of my mates there and i said what's what's going on then and he said listen it, it, it's fucked up so i've literally punched him through the bars in the jaw he's gone on his ass next thing i've got like 20 screws around me trying to bend me up Got put in the cell, and I'll never forget it. You get when you get nicked, you go down to segregation the following morning, and you have to go in front of the governor. It's the only time I've gone into a governor's meeting, and there was about ten officers in there. Normally, you get two. She was that convinced I was going to cave, and um, obviously, where I've gone on to the, the segregation unit, you get like the orderlies that are prisoners that are in charge of keeping uh, the segregation a bit clean, and um, I've managed to get messages back to the wing. And um, I've gone in there and she said, right, I've got this individual who's going to come down. I want you to tell me what's happened. Then we're going to get him in the room with all of the officers here so he's safe. Then I'm going to end up shipping you out of the prison. And I was like, not a problem. She said, what happened? I said, it's the funniest thing. I said, he had a roll up behind his ear and I went through the bars to try and grab it. And he sort of reacted and fell over. It's plain as fucking day that I smacked him in the mouth. And she went, oh, right. And she, even she's having a giggle at it. She said, what we're going to do now is we're going to get him in. And she said, all right. So he's come walking in. There's all these officers standing around me. She said, you're safe. Listen, you're safe. He can't hurt you anymore. I thought, well, fuck am I? Like the violent stepdad here was saying. And uh, he said, no, no, it's not a problem. I'll tell you the truth. And I'm sitting there. I haven't even looked at him. And she said, tell me what happened. He said, he said I had this roll up behind my ear. Gooch tried to grab it. Right? She went, fuck off. Get him out. Get him off the wing. And I ended up going back to the wing. And we ended up getting out about a month later. But she was hell bent on getting me. Hell bent. Escape from lawful custody. This, this is the one. In my 37 years, these were the most peculiar 72 hours I had. Or I think I'll ever have. So, 
I'm with my mate, uh, Matty Norton, his name is. Lovely fella. And um, I've been on the run for about two years. And I was looking at a substantial sentence. I think I was up for a Section 18 GBH and a load of others. But my barrister was telling me I was looking at about 10 years. So obviously I decided I wasn't really up for doing that. And um, I went on the run. And uh, I was staying at my pal's place. And at the time we was doing all the high performance cars. And this is before the days of AMPR and number plate recognition systems. You didn't have none of that. You could literally get a Chordy car and drive around in it on original plates. Unless the police officers see it and realised it was stolen or done a check on it, you just blend it in. And um, my mates rang me and said, listen, I've got a, a brand new Range Rover supercharger. I'm desperate for dough. Give me a grand for it. You can have it. And I said, all right, let me make a call. So I rang my mate up and he was in uh, Richmond. And um, I said, look, I've got a Range Rover there. I want three grand for it. He went, I'll take it all day long. I said, sweet. So I'm thinking I've made two grand here. So I've gone and met the geezer and I've picked Matty's with me and uh, he's in his full summer outfit. It's a nice hot day and uh, he's in his little flip flop. So I'm in my little tracksuit and uh, we're driving up the A316 into uh, towards London and all of a sudden there's a van following us, like a little Astra van. And Matty said, this geezer's following us. And I was like, oh, mate. So sort of done a few turns and he's still on us. So I thought, fuck this. So I've stopped the car. I've jumped out and I've actually run to his car to take the keys out of his motor and launch him. So he couldn't follow us. But what he's ended up doing is he's just reversed up the road. So I'm chasing the car. And I can see he's on the phone. So I've run back to the Range Rover. And on the 316, there's a big Sainsbury's as you're going into London just before Twickenham. And I pulled in the car park and I've looked at mate and I said, this is drastic measures, mate. So I've stopped and we sort of reversed onto the bonnet of the van. So the, the rear wheels of the Range Rover are now by the windscreen. This is how hard we hit it. And then we've wheel spinned off of him. He's writ off. And we've pulled out and we've carried on going towards Twickenham Rugby Ground. Now, in the distance, all you can see is blue lights. And we're like, what's going on here? So we've got there, and what they'd done was they'd sort of, because it's a dual carriageway, they'd doubled up four patrol cars, and we sort of went straight through the middle of them, about 60, 70 mile an hour. And then we got to the next junction, and it was another four cars, so we, we've gone through those. And we ended up literally outside Twickenham Rugby Ground, and they actually boxed us in. They'd done all four tyres, they put all of the windows through, we got CS gas to bits, and all I was doing was going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, trying to make a hole, and somehow we managed to pull out. Holy shit. And now we've ended up coming away from London. So now we're going back towards the M3. And uh, we got to um, somewhere just before Hampton. And uh, we got to a bit, I see a baby on board sign in the car in front and there was no pavement. So I thought, fuck you, it's, it's going to be a decamp. So we've ended up jumping out the car. I've looked at him and I said, you're fucked, you're in flip-flops. So he sort of just sat in the motor and like, resigned to the fact that he's getting nicked. And I've ended up running. And I, I remember I was behind these, you know, the clothes recycle bins. I was sat behind on the phone to my mate and I said, you've got to come pick me up. And he's like, all right, where are you? And I said, I'm behind these bins in this school. You need to come and pick me up. And uh, But half hour later, he's run back. He said, listen, you fucked. <laughs> I said, why? He said, they've corned off everywhere. He said, you can't even walk into where you are. He said, they, they've shut it all off. And then the next thing, I had a police dog on my ankles. So I've come out. Now, we're... My attitude towards police is that people hate police. I don't. You can hate police as 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 a whole system, but you can't hate individuals if you don't know them. At the end of the day, it's a job. Someone's going to do it. And believe it or not, I've met a lot of police officers that are nice and that do do a good job. But then I've met a lot of fucking assholes as well. And on this day, I met an asshole. So the police dog wouldn't stop attacking me. So I've ended up beating the dog up. I just started punching the fucking shit out of the dog. And then I've ended up in the back of the van. They've ended up beating me up in cuffs and I had broken fucking cheekbone and my ribs. And I get to the police station. I was taken to Twickenham Police Station. And uh, they said, look, we're going to remand you. So I said, all right, so you'll be going to court tomorrow. You'll be going to Kingston Magistrates Court. And I said, all right, not a problem. So I got to Kingston Magistrates Court and I'm thinking, fuck's sake, I've got to do something drastic here. Because I thought, once you're in the prison system, it's very hard to escape. And uh, I'm sitting and I thought, how can I do this? I thought, fuck it, fake heart attack. So, and it was, it was sod's law, right? Because at the time <laughs> I've been partying a lot. So I've sort of faked this fit on the floor. They've come running. You know, I've got like one eye open and I'm thinking, is it happening? And they've called the paramedics. And I'm inside, I'm like, fucking yes, go get me to the hospital. 
And um, they've took me away and they've took me to Kingston Hospital. But now, because I've been remanded in my absence, I'm now under Wandsworth Guard. Now, if you're admitted to a hospital, you've obviously got to be able to eat. You've got to be able to have a shower and stuff. So what they do is they put you on this thing called a closet chain, which is basically a handcuff with six foot of chain and then another handcuff and you're handcuffed to the officer. It just allows you movement. And what happened was they next to my bed where I was, at first we had like armed response gathers patrolling, but after three days they, they jogged on. And they had this like room, it was like a wet room, but it didn't have any windows. And there was a gap underneath the door. So what they was doing is they're putting the chain under the door and then they were sitting outside the door so I could shut it and then I could have a shower and do what I was doing. And obviously you get the, um, the soap dispensers. So I've got this soap dispenser and I'm on here trying to get it all off. And I've actually pulled it off. Now, let me tell you, the only thing I can equate to this feeling, it must be when you win the lottery. When you're in custody and you get that cup off, it is the greatest feeling on earth. So now I'm left with the problem. It, he didn't double lock the cuff. So normally they do a little pin in it and it stops the cuff from opening up. He didn't do that. So I've managed to spin it round, put it back on my wrist. But now I've got even more room to get out. So we've come out and I'm, I've got onto the hospital bed and I've got like my knees up with the, the cover going over the top and I've managed to get the cuff off and I've handcuffed it to the side. You know, a prison, um, a hospital bed, it's like bars, isn't it? So I've handcuffed the officer to the bars, but he doesn't know it because I've got the cover over me. Now, <laughs> I know where the fire exit is. Now, I've chosen my point to dash and... I. T to this day, funniest thing I've ever seen because I've run out of this hospital and for six foot, he was on my ass. But as soon as it run out of chain, it done like a triple somersault in the air. <laughs> the bed come out behind him. He's flat out. I'm out the fire exit. Now, bearing in mind, I've got a drip hanging out my arm and I've got a hospital gown on and I am completely naked other than trainers. <laughs> so now, in my head, it's like at normal. <laughs> So I've managed to come out of the hospital. Now, mm. all I've got on me was my mate come up to the hospital. I had a £20 note and I had an eighth of puff to take him. Now, all of this is in between my arse cheeks, right? Because <laughs> I've got no pockets. So I've now run out the hospital. I've run up the road and I'll never forget it. There was um, a geezer getting into his car. And I've sort of, looking back, I can think what he was thinking. And it couldn't have been anything positive. <laughs> I've sort of run up behind him and I'm like... You're giving me a lift out of Kingston. And he was like, I am. <laughs> so you can, you can imagine it in his hospital gown. So I got in the back of his car and we started driving out. Now I'm in the back and I'm like, thank fuck, I'm out. <sighs> Little did I know, Clever Clogs that, uh, that was tied to the bed has got up, come out and he commandeered a black taxi. And he's now following us. And I don't know. So as we pulled up to lights... I'm like elation. I turn around and this prick's here again. And I'm like... <laughs> so I've ended up getting out of the car. I've ended up hitting the officer again. He's gone over. <laughs> then I've had a load of binmen. This is back in the days before the council bins. You had the, the round bins with the lids. They're trying to box me in. So now I'm banging binmen. I've got away from them. Oh, mate. So now I've completely lost everyone again. I'm on my own again. And I thought, right, I could hear helicopters coming. I thought, I've got to plot up. I'm going to have to plot up this. I've gone into a load of back gardens and I found this shed. When you went in the shed, it luckily had a lock on the inside. So I've locked myself in and there was like two um, old mountain bikes leaning up against the side with a bit of tarpaulin. So I've um, sort of got underneath the tarpaulin and I thought, look, as long as I don't move here, they'll fuck off and I can just walk and get a lift. So I'm sitting here with my £20 note and my eight for puff. Can't do fuck all with either one of them. And all of a sudden, this geezer comes to open the garage from the outside and he can't open the door because I've locked it. So I'm in there thinking, fuck, I don't know whether it's old Bill, I don't know who it is. All of a sudden, he's ripped the garage door out, and it's like this 65-year-old man. And I'm like, oh, mate. So I can see him through the tarpaulin. And he's walked in, and he's going, he's talking to himself, and he's like, oh, that's been moved. That's been moved. And I'm thinking, don't touch the fucking sheet. Don't touch the fucking sheet. And he's grabbed the sheet and pulled it off. Ooh. I've jumped up. I must, I'm sweating. My hair's all over the gaff. I'm in this fucking hospital gown. I'm naked. My bollocks are swinging everywhere. And he started rubbing his arm. And I'm like, don't have a fucking heart attack for fuck's sake. I was like, look, I ain't like that. I said, I, I don't want to hurt you. I said, I I've jogged on from these. I just want to go home, mate. He went, don't worry. I used to get in trouble as a kid as well. And I'm like, fucking yes. <laughs> I'm like, yes. So he's walked me into the house and he had like a, um, a breakfast bar with the stools. 
So I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, thank fuck for this. The helicopter is circling over the top of us. And uh, the wife walks in. She went, what's going on? And he's sort of explaining it. I'm out of breath, fucked. And uh, she went, oh, let me go and get you something to wear. Now, as she's walked out, I've clocked her, pick up the cordless phone. Mm. And I'm like, fuck sake. So now I've jumped up and I'm saying, I've run to the front door and it's locked. So I'm going, where are the fucking keys? Where are the fucking keys? And he's like, I don't know. I don't know. So I thought, fuck this. So I've gone out into the shed. I've grabbed one of these fucking bikes I was hiding there. Now, when I say mountain bike, it's like a 1930s thing with the big springs under the seat and the thin tyres. I've come out the front onto the road. Two flat tyres, and I'm driving this push bike up the road right now. I swear to God, if I could take a Kodak of the two officers that drew past, <laughs> priceless. They've literally driven past me in the road. I'm in this hospital gown. I'm sweating everywhere. I mean, bollocks are swinging all over the gaff where the gown's coming over one leg. They've literally gone and watched me go past and then instantly spun round on me. Now... We used to do this thing as kids. If you was getting chased by police, if you imagine you've got two houses next to each other, we, where we was young, we was a bit nippy. We'd get in front, we'd run into the back garden, but then we'd jump over the fence and come back out the same way and they'd carry on going. So it's worked like a gem. I've gone over the back fence, I've nipped through and I've come back out and they're all still going in that direction. Now, at this point, I used to be quite small. And my little party trick, if you remember the old black bins, is I could get a black bin, flip it over my head, kneel down and put it flush to the floor and I'm inside the bin. The amount of gathers I lost with this method was was countless. And um, I'm sweating. It's red hot. So I've put the bin over the top of me and when it's got down to my arms to the point where I can't move, I've just fallen over. <laughs> so now my arms and legs are just wiggling out the bottom of the bin and I can't get out. <laughs> and all of a sudden the police dogs come, the dog is gnawing me fucking feet to death. The police got me out, and the, to be fair, that was that was all right. These uh, these metropolitan police gathers, and he got me in the car. So let me tell you, that is the funniest fucking thing I have ever seen in my life. He said, "What part of your brain thought you looked normal on that push bike?" I said, "Well, I had to just deal with what I had." Do you know what I mean? And um, I was lucky, really, because I got done for escape from lawful custody. I actually ended up with another fourteen offences just from the escape. Um, and I managed to get all of them dropped. I think I got done for a skate from lawful custody and theft of the push bike. Um, and then I bus case on two of the other more serious charges. And then I ended up doing two and a half years out of a five year sentence. So I was quite lucky in that. That respect. was lucky, but, wasn't it? But that was a uh, that was an adventure. That one.